White against the 2210. When in doubt, sack the king. Okay, hopefully we'll be making our opponent do that. E4, E5. And of course, we play knight F3. And as I was explaining uh, in, in the last video, th there's a dilemma I have when I get to uh, the higher, higher ratings where on the one hand, I want to play what I recommend, which in this case is the four knight scotch. On the other hand, we're facing opponents who are strong to the point where I would be more comfortable playing my main repertoire. But with that said, I still think the four knight scotch is so powerful a weapon at most levels that we're going to play it here. And uh, we're going to see how our opponent reacts to it. Another alternative is to actually play the Belgrade Gambit, um, which is E takes D4 and Knight D5. And I've played the Belgrade a, a, a very good amount in uh, semi-competitive tournament games. Like I played it in uh, a rapid tournament against Vidit. And got a good position. I played it against Eric Hansen. So I've done a fair amount of analysis in the Belgrade. And I think it's a much more dangerous gambit than it's given credit for. Um, it's considered to be a completely unsound line that was last popular in the 1970s. And is basically buried under a pile of rubble. So our choice is to play Knight takes D4 and go into the main line scotch. But as a nice little wrinkle, let's throw Knight D5 at our opponent. And let's see how a good player reacts to an unexpected opening surprise. So knight d5 is called the Belgrade Gambit. If you're watching this on YouTube, you very likely are seeing this move for the first time. Now, maybe you've seen me play this in Blitz. Um, and it's a Gambit because, well, obviously you don't recapture the d4 pawn, which may seem crazy, but the centralization of the knight faces black with a couple of immediate problems. It also faces black with a huge dilemma where he has like six or seven legitimate responses to the Belgrade. Uh, so there's knight takes e4, which is the most dangerous move uh, for black, grabbing a second pawn but giving white like a massive initiative. There is knight takes d5, which is the simplifying move. That's what Vidit played against me, and he did not manage to equalize. The book recommendation, as far as I know, most books recommend one of two moves. One is this weird move knight b4 that you're probably not going to play unless, like, unless you know the line because it just doesn't occur to someone. And the other is the sort of simple, modest move, bishop e7, just developing the bishop and uh, essentially asking white what he's going to do with that knight. h6 is another very reasonable move. And the point of this move is clear. Black is preventing bishop g5, which is one of white's main ideas in the Belgrade to put immediate pressure on this knight. And I'll give you some context after the game. I'll kind of explain the, the basics of the Belgrade as, as I understand it. Now... In this position, if you follow the, the kind of old recommendations of the original proponents of the Belgrade, you're going to get a terrible position. Like, the Belgrade, as it was originally played, does not even come close to equalizing. I mean, White can get close to a lost position out of the opening. But I analyzed it with a strong engine, and I was able to find ways that you can kind of liven up the opening and make moves that are virtually unknown, but give White... A very, very decent chances. And this is one of those situations. If I remember correctly, the move that I came up with with the engine is bishop to d3. And rarely did the, did the original Belgrade players kind of play in this fashion. They would usually go bishop f4. They would recapture the pawn. I don't actually remember what the correct move is here. Um, it might be knight takes d4. Yeah, h6 is like the one move that I don't remember. I know that in response to... There is a line where white plays bishop d3 and then repositions the bishop to g5. I actually think it is here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's bishop to d3. And uh, the line that I'm sort of remembering is if black plays d6 here, you take the knight and then you reposition the bishop to b5 in order to recapture the d4 pawn. The weird semi engine -y kind of line. Of course, black can also try to develop the bishop outside the pawn chain, so bishop c5 is possible. But that move also comes with associated risks. In particular, that bishop on c5 could be very vulnerable to a queenside pawn storm. And there's a common idea where white plays a3 and b4. And apart from forcing this bishop to, many in many cases, lose contact with the d-pawn, you're also opening up a nice fianchetto square for our dark squared bishop. Of course, the other drawback of h6, thinking very long term, is that once black castles kingside, if we do, in fact, leave the bishop on its original diagonal, then there are situations where the sacrifice on h6 can be very dangerous. 
But the basic thing to understand is that knight takes d5 is almost always in white's favor because we recapture on d5 and several things happen. First of all, the knight on c6 is kicked away. When it's kicked away, black runs the risk of losing the d4 pawn. And if black takes on d5 too early and white is able to put a rook on e1, black often just gets massacred down the e-file. So that is to be avoided by experienced players. d6 is played. And now I'm pretty sure that my line goes knight takes f6, queen takes f6, and bishop b5. We could also probably start with bishop b5. What is the minus of doing that? If we start with bishop b5 and black takes the pawn on e4, I'm definitely not scared of that. Then we can even just castle and get a massive development advantage. So I actually like the look of bishop b5 immediately here. Yeah, let's do it. Bishop b5. So we kind of, we've waited for black to play d6, and now we re reposition the bishop on b5, which is much more sensible than if we had done it here, because here bishop b5 is kind of an empty move. It doesn't pin the knight, and so it loses a lot of its effectiveness. Now it does pin the knight, and it threatens knight takes d4, recapturing the pawn with interest. So very, very complex position right out of the gates. And there's a lot of openings like this that you can pick up on and with, with, the, with the aid of Chessable, you can construct a repertoire that is centered around these very tricky lines that people still don't know very well. And the Belgrade is, is definitely one of them. A lot of these lines have bad reputations, but if you analyze them carefully, King's Gambit also belongs in that category where it, it's got this reputation and so people don't analyze it. And as a result, if you study it very carefully, if you look at like Nepo's Chessable course, you can actually get very, very good positions out of these openings. Which is a side note to my main recommendations in the speedrun, which are more mainstream, but this is just, you know, a, a piece of advice if you're trying to construct a multifaceted opening repertoire. Like maybe you have a main line and then you, you're trying to find, you know, side, side openings to make your experience more interesting. But, okay, right now we have to make a decision. The simple option is to play bishop takes c6, then knight takes f6, and then we can recapture the pawn on t4 either with the queen or with the knight. And we can recapture the sacrificed pawn and maybe get a very, very modest advantage at best because we do ruin Black's pawn structure in that position. But that pawn mass on the queen side is often not really considered a weakness in these uh, in E4 openings. And we also give Black the bishop pair and we give Black uncontested control of the light squares. So the other option is just to keep the tension with bishop A4. And I quite like the look of that. Let's go bishop, well... Ah, whatever. No guts, no glory. Let's go bishop a4. Just keep the tension. And obviously we're allowing b5, but then the bishop repositions to b3, and it eyes the f7 pawn, which of course is a major weakness in these types of positions. My intuitive guess is that bishop a4 is inferior objectively. Probably the best is to take on c6, take on f6, and maybe even take on d4 with the queen and play that endgame, but Again, not really in the spirit of the Belgrade, and this poses, I think, more practical problems to Black. Yeah, there, there is a chessable course on the Belgrade, which probably has a lot of these modern ideas. You can check it out, but I'll, I'll look it up after the game and, and give you a little bit of context on it. B5. Okay, so obviously, th there's no need for us to take on F6. Again, that defeats the purpose. The purpose is maximum tension. Knight to E5. Huh, so that is an interesting move. Offering a second knight trade. So let's rule out the bad options. I think taking on e5 makes zero sense. It fixes the pawn structure, allows black to defend d4. So the obvious move to me is knight takes d4. What could our opponent be intending? So this kind of smells like a Noah's Ark trap. Anytime you have this construction and the knight leaves c6, you have to worry about the possibility of c5, c4 trapping the bishop. And if c5 comes with tempo, then that might be a major problem. And you, oftentimes you have to figure out tactical ways to save this bishop. So the question is, after knight takes d4, c5, do we have a way of saving our light squared bishop tactically? And I think we do. I think we have a cool trick where we can take on f6 with check. And then, sorry, the queen will recapture. So again, takes, c5, takes, takes. We go bishop to d5. And we attack the exposed rook in the corner. And we jump ahead of the pawn, of the pawn storm. If the rook moves, then we can safely move our knight. We can even move it up to c6 and try to uh, wrest the initiative from black's hands. Yeah, I don't see much else that we, that we can do here other than knight takes d4. 
And I was just checking to see if Black can't get away with some sort of exchange sacrifice, but I think the coast is clear. I think the coast is clear. So knight f6 and bishop d5. So this is our idea. Hopefully I'm not missing some tactic here because one thing you have to consider is c takes d4. And if we take the rook in the corner, there's a temporary moment where we're kind of underdeveloped and scattered and Black's got this queen, which is menacingly aimed at f2. So I just took a couple of seconds to verify that Black doesn't have any like immediate win in that position. So for instance, cd bishop a8, bishop g4 has to be considered because who can tell me what happens if in that position you play queen takes d4? A little bit of visualization training. And what should white do instead of queen takes d4? Trickier question because there is another really, really bad option in that position. So in that case, black plays knight f3, discovering an attack against the queen and wins the queen. So the correct move, I think, after cd bishop a8, bishop g4, would also not be to play pawn f3, never play f3, because if knight takes f3 check, and after black recaptures on f3, there's a fork on the queen and the rook, not to mention that white's king is wide open in the center. So the careful option after bishop g4 would be this very awkward looking move, queen to d2, which is a move that I think a lot of people have a natural resistance to because it blocks the bishop, but there's bigger fish to fry here. It's not about... Positional principles were up in exchange, so we just need to solve the immediate problems. Also, a benefit of this little battery is that the queen can go up to f4 later on and challenge its counterpart on f6, so it's not all bad. But when you're, you know, you always have to know what the priorities are, right? When you're trying to survive and consolidate a material advantage, positional considerations and general guidelines of development go on the back burner completely. And your, your top allegiance is to keeping your king safe and making sure you're not allowing your opponent to keep the flames of the initiative going. And it's important, I think, to identify these mental blocks. Like, it's important to identify where you're automatically rejecting a particular type of move. Everybody has certain moves that, you know, certain triggering moves, lack of a better term. And by identifying them, you're often able to root out sort of preconceived notions of what, what's good and what's not. If bishop g4 immediately, well, that's a great question. Our opponent asks us the same question. Just a second. Okay, so obviously by the transitive principle, we can play queen d2 here, and cd bishop takes a it transposes into that line. But in response to queen to d2, my guess is that block wants to move the rook. Let's leave that to the side for a second. We have alternatives here. One thing we can do is drop this knight back and uh, remove the threat on the knight and win a tempo against the rook. And then we can chase the bishop away with h3. But we also have to calculate the move f3. After f3, c takes d4, we can actually take the bishop instead of taking the rook. Very easy detail to miss. How do we evaluate that position? Well, black probably will have to move the rook in that position because the check on h4 is almost never dangerous due to g3. Meh. A little bit precarious there because we can't castle. The f-file will be open. And if we play rook f1, then our king will be permanently stuck in the center. So I don't love that option. Which means we're deciding between queen d2 and knight to e2. Knight f3 is not an option because black just takes twice with a fork. Knight to e2 is what appeals to me the most. And I'll explain why. There's actually a positional component to this decision there's a bishop currently on d5, and that's a pretty major outpost. But the piece that we really want to occupy that square, the, the best piece to occupy that square would be a knight. So e2 is a great transit point to eventually get to Frankfurt Airport, eventually get to either c3 or f4, and ultimately to d5. Okay, so now I think most people would be inclined to play h3, but that's not mandatory. We can also just leave the bishop on g4 and just castle. and. The benefit of that is we could play f3 afterward, chasing the bishop away, but also unpinning the knight and creating a little pawn chain in the center. So one thing I like, or one thing we have to look at after castles is knight f3 check. Gf3, bishop f3. But in that position, I think we can go queen to d3. This is like advanced calculation, so I'll spell this out after the game. But long story short, I think we should just castle. A little bit scary, but nothing major. And white is definitely better. So the line I was just referencing is what happens if black tries to sack the knight on f3, then recapture with the bishop and 
you know, this classic pattern with a queen coming to the G file. Yeah, the, the, the point of the defensive move queen d3 is simple. We need to unpin the knight in that position because the knight can block a queen's check from g3, but that will expose the queen. So we preemptively move the queen forward and potentially create lateral defensive options of queen g3 should the bishop move. Okay. Now we enter a different stage of the game. We're, we're out of the opening. We're into the middle game. Let's see if we can positionally outplay our opponent using our biggest assets. And our biggest asset is the d5 square. But we also have nice piece coordination. Black's got, you know, potentially weak pawns and an underdeveloped kingside that will grant us, I think, the two tempi that we need to develop central pressure. Bishop b7, obviously. Okay, so I think f3 is virtually automatic here. Again, we'd have to play check for knight takes f3, but that clearly doesn't work. Okay. Now, a big mistake would be to play bishop takes bishop because that would allow black to recapture with the pawn and nullify our biggest strength. Black would have the, the d5 square defended. So the obvious move here is knight f4. I think this is better than knight c3 because knight c3 walks right into b4, right? So don't just choose a square at random. Try to be discriminating when it comes to understanding how to get a piece to an outpost. Don't just blindly put it on the first square you see. But knight f4 isn't even mandatory because there is a, a logistical problem that happens after knight f4, let's say black castles. The issue is that we have nowhere to put this bishop to make space for the knight to get to d5 because we can't go back to b3. That walks into c4 and we lose our bishop. If we take on e6, black always recaptures with a pawn. So as much as I'd love to get a knight to d5, I think that might have to go on the back burner unless we don't see anything more, more effective to do. So are there other ways to approach this position? Well, I think there are. We've been looking at the positional approach centered around getting our pieces to a better score. What if we try to develop an initiative using our pawns? What about the move f4? So f4 is really scary for black because this knight doesn't have a lot of good squares to go to. If the knight drops back to g6, black walks into a fork. If after f4 black plays knight g4, we trap the knight with h3. So after f4, black might have to drop back to d7. And that looks like a very awkward move in that position. I think we can even try to hunt down some of black's minor pieces. I like the look of f4. Oh, I did miss knight c4. That probably is the best move that black can make. But then we have a check on c6. And we can force black's king to move over to f8, harming the, the connection between the rooks, which can be very, very important as the game moves to a more tactical position. Yeah, f4 is uh, an advanced move. It's advanced, but it's simultaneously obvious. Like, I think a, a newer player might play f4, but a more advanced player might fall in love with the d5 square, which is kind of a cool thing about chess. Like, sometimes ignorance is bliss in chess, and ignorance makes you find the best move just because you're not aware of the enticing but wrong positional ideas that somebody else would play. Okay. So let's see what our opponent decides. One detail, if black plays bishop takes d5, we actually take the knight in that position and win a piece because the queen is under attack and the bishop is under attack. Knight d7, okay, what we expected. Okay, now I need a little bit of thinking time because we've got many options here. Even e5 has to be considered. Just trying to blast open the center and use the fact that the king is currently stranded in the center. But... The cool idea that I came up with is bishop c6 anyway, threatening f5, and trying to just trying to go after black's minor pieces. So let's consider it. Bishop c6, rook b6, which is a problem. f5, rook c6, fe queen e6, knight f4, queen takes e4, unconvincing. Although still looks very good for white. Actually, knight c5 there. And if queen c4, huh. so many tempting options here. Let's consider e5. So e5, pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5. Queen doesn't have many squares. It has to take on e5. Okay, do we have a move there? We don't have bishop f4 because of queen takes d5, and the knight defends the rook in the end. So e5 takes, takes, takes. Bishop takes e6, queen takes e6, knight f4 maybe? Yeah, that looks very pro. That actually looks almost winning just intuitively, but maybe I'm misevaluating. Still, I am leaning toward playing e5 and just trying to smash through the barricades using tactics. 
which kind of shows you the different approaches that you can take to a position. We took this in a completely different direction. Whereas when I was playing the move knight e2, I was convinced that we would get the knight to d5 like a good Russian schoolboy, but we've ended up playing a completely different sequence of moves. If I'd have known that I wanted to treat the position that way, maybe the immediate f4 would have been more accurate. But we'll sort the details out after the game. So we go e5. D so here's the thing. After pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, it's a double attack on the queen. Both the rook and the pawn are attacking it. So that's why black can't take with a knight. So after pawn takes, pawn takes, the queen could also slide over to g6. But in that position, white is a very, very powerful move that essentially wins the game. It, it sends black into a complete tailspin. Who sees, uh, who sees the move after queen g6? Yeah, just knight f4 with like a massive attack. You, you can stop calculating once you see a move like that. So after pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, queen takes e5. A lot of people would get excited by the alignment of the queen and the rook and say, oh, we just go bishop f4 and we win the exchange. But no, because you lose one bishop on d5 and then you lose the other bishop when the knight recaptures it on b8. So after pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes, we first take the bishop on e6. If black takes with a pawn, then bishop f4 works. Black has to take with a queen. Well, we already know that when the queen is on e6 and g6, it allows the knight to jump into the game with tempo. Knight f4 looks very strong. And in that position... I'm using my intuition to evaluate it. Black is uber exposed in the center. And most importantly, we could then play the move rookie one to try to prevent black from castling. It's one of those positions where if we can prevent black from castling, we're probably winning. If you give black one extra tempo and they castle, we might actually be like borderline losing because we've sacrificed a pawn and exposed our own king. Oh, lift and uber, yeah. Hopefully that made decent sense. Yeah, there, there there are some like more subtle approaches like to play bishop c6 after d takes e5, but I like the idea that we've come up with. Just f takes e5, open all the files, and stick our pieces on good central squares. <laughs> a rook uber <laughs> rather than a rook left, lol. Okay, d e. Let's just play fb quickly. From a time consideration, like we don't want to spend too much time here because we will need that time to meditate after black makes his response. So we go down this path. Knight f4. All of this is pretty obvious. I would recommend that people spend, you know, 10, 15 seconds per move. But in this particular instance, I want to conserve a little bit of time for, for the middle game. Because we're still only on move 20. So now our opponent has another big choice. He has to decide where to put the queen. And my instinct would be to play queen to d6 here. But the downside of that move is that it again puts the queen and the rook on alignment. So we could stick the knight on d5, and then we would be threatening bishop f4 with great effect. So where else can the queen go? Well, queen c6 is possible, but then the queen loses contact with the bishop, which means that rook e1 is super effective, because then it prevents black from castling. This should be winning for white. I think it is flat out winning, because all we've done is sacrificed a pawn. We haven't really made any other huge commitments, and what we have in return for the pawn is just a massive initiative. I would even call it an attack. We're not just calling the shots. We're literally going after the king. Queen to f6. Wow, that is not a move that was even on my radar, but maybe it's best. I don't know. Because it it walks right into the discovery. But I think what you're noticing, which I missed, is that queen f6 does threaten to exchange queens with queen to d4 check. And it's very important, I think. I mean, I have a good example of this. When you're trying to conduct an initiative of this kind, don't automatically rule out lines that involve a queen trade. Because sometimes even after the queen trade, you might just like win a minor piece or the attack continues into the end game. So for example, let's say black plays queen f6 and you're trying to consider the move rookie one. You see, well, that doesn't work because black can force the queen trade with queen d4 check. But you have to keep calculating because there, even after the queens are off, we would have had knight d5 winning the bishop on e7. Our opponent goes for the obvious move, queen c6. Now we have... As I see it, two candidate moves. Or actually, even three. We can put a queen on the e-file. We can put a rook on the e-file. Or we could start with the more direct move, knight to d5. But knight d5 looks like it, it sort of commits a little bit too early. And maybe black can respond there with, with knight to f6. And every trade makes the attack harder to conduct. So knight f6, we can take the bishop. Black takes with the king. Looks terrifying, but we're running out of pieces. 
So I like the look of rookie one, but it occurs to me that black can play knight f6 in response and restrict our knight, prevent it from reaching d5, which is really annoying. Rook e1, knight f6. And then black wants to play rook b7, and then he'll be ready to castle. So just wait a second. This, this should be promising, but I have to be very accurate. Huh. It was harder than I anticipated. So rook e1, knight f6. Do we have a move there? I mean, we can try to open up the queen side, but that doesn't seem to be particularly promising. We need to, there's rook b7. There's this annoying defensive move that defends the bishop with the rook. So maybe we should play knight d5 after all. Huh. This is very, very good defense by our opponent. Okay. I'm starting to lean in the direction of knight d5, actually. Okay. <laughs> there are some super complicated lines I was like, whoa, bishop f6. In fact, right away. Okay, that wasn't on my radar either. That is not a particularly natural move. Okay. But I see its point. I mean, the point is to give us this check on d4, I guess. Yeah, probably the best move, something tells me. Okay, so we can go bishop f4, bishop d4, king h1, queen d5, bishop b8, knight b8, and then c3 picks up the bishop. Probably about equal there. Hmm. Queen f3 also is interesting here. Queen f3 is very interesting. Because queen f3 sets up threats against black's queen and pre prepares rook e1. I really, really like the look of queen f3, but there he's got knight e5, but then queen e4. Huh. Okay, I'm going to go with my gut here and play queen f3, which is, which is another move that I think, I wouldn't call it like an advantage. It might be a bad move, but the, the basic idea is that it prevents black from castling, not because you take the bishop, then the queen recaptures, but instead you have knight to e7 discovering, discover check against the queen. The other benefit of this move is that it aims at the f7 pawn. So if black delivers a check on d4, we simply shift our king over, and black has to deal with an additional threat on f7. The battle revolves around one thing and one thing only. Can we prevent black from castling? If yes, if we can get the rest of our pieces into the attack, we should have, at the very, very, very least, like, overwhelming practical compensation, because then the attack will have will last for the rest of the game if we can force black's king onto f8. Um, I'm also playing against Black's Queen, which is a like advanced thing to do. I'm trying to make it very uncomfortable for Black's Queen because if Queen e6, then there's a fork. If Queen d6, then the bishop comes out with a pin. Rook c8, very logical move, and I saw this move. And now we can, I think, force Black's King to move with Rook e1 check. But is there anything better that we could do? I think Rook e1 is all that we have because Black is now threatening to castle. Black can't castle now, because the queen is defended. Unless I'm missing something. I mean, yeah, you have bishop takes h6 there, but that's not... No, we have to go rookie one. In f8. Okay, now I think we should bring our reserves into the attack. Bishop f4 makes a lot of sense. We don't really have time for a move like c3, I'm afraid, because then the knight jumps into e5. So at this point, we just have to throw caution to the wind and get our pieces into the game. So this would be my instinct, which I'm playing basically without calculation, because I, I think we have to try this move, whether it works or not. Without all of the pieces, we won't be able to break through the, to storm the barricades here. The attack is definitely not over. In fact, it hasn't even begun yet. We're just bringing our pieces into the game. I would estimate that Black probably can defend here with some computer moves, but for a human, this is wildly unpleasant for Black. And remember, we've only sacrificed a pawn. This is something people often forget. Like It's not like we have sacrificed a minor piece or a rook. We don't need to hurry as much as we would have to if we had sacrificed something bigger. Yeah, of course, black can take b2. But that only helps us get our rook to where we want it to be anyway. Then we've sacked two pawns. Bishop takes b2, we go rook a to d1. A lot of people, I think, would instinctively play rook b1. But that's just an empty one-move threat. And the bishop wants to return anyway to d4 with check. So good example of like not making the autopilot move if black takes the pawn. Another autopilot move would be like knight e7, but remember that that allows the queen trade. And in the end of the line, the rook is also hanging on a1. So, so knight e7 is an idea in general, but only if, for instance, the king is on g8 or something. Rook e7 is not 
a valid idea here, unless the bishop moves. Okay. So now our opponent is starting to get low on time. And there's a gorgeous idea. If black tries to run away with his king, does anybody see like a, a really, really pretty tactical move? It might not even be winning, but it's a pretty concept in response to... In fact, I think king g8 might be a, a decent move here. Okay, bishop b2, nerves of steel. Yeah, there was this move, rook to e8 check, deflecting the rook so that knight e7 would then pick up the queen. But it's a moot point. We go rook 81 immediately, and knight f6. Okay, now I need to think in silence, because this is getting ultra tactical. And we don't have much time. Three result game. Okay, think, think, think. Mine is in a bit of a haze right now. Rook e7, knight d5. Uh, rookie 795, what do we have there? Uh, crap. 795 is, I don't like. Bishop d6, queen takes d6, no. Knight takes f6, he plays queen takes f6. Oh. We can play c3. We can play knight b6. We can play knight f6. Queen f6. Rook d6. Like, I see so many tempting options, but nothing that, like, truly appeals to me. That's the big issue here. Knight f6, he also has bishop f6. Amazingly. Incredible. But there's no mate there. Okay, I'm going to go c3. I'm going to play the slow move. I'm going to play the slow move. Which I, I'm sure is not the best move. It might even be a very bad move, but... I'm playing also for his clock here, because... Moves like c3 are, are hard to face in time pressure because it suddenly gives black a very wide choice of options. And I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously trapping the bishop. I'm not attacking the bishop yet, but let's not neglect an idea like rook to e2, which would hit the bishop, and the bishop has a3, but okay, it's a moot point, takes, takes. Yeah, but now I thought we have a tactic, but of course I miscalculated, but it might still be winning. Rook d8 check exists, and we might have to play it. I don't see another move. We have to go rook d8, but it's not over because black takes one. He obviously missed this move, but we might not even be better. Th I mean, kind of gets tactical. Okay, he has to take. I'm not going to pre-move queen c6 in case he plays queen e8, but takes, takes, king g takes. We must have a win there. Bishop c7, rook d1. Bishop c7, rook d1. It's dangerous for white suddenly. Where's the win? There must be a win here. It must be. But we don't want to... He can go queen e7 because of rook d1. If we go queen c7, he has rook f8. Rook e8. Okay, I think this move is probably our best chance. Hmm... I think bishop c7 makes the most sense. Rook e8, and he blunders bishop d6. Yeah, a bit of an anticlimactic ending. He, he played way too quickly. I think white is winning there. The only chance after bishop c7, every other move loses instantly, is rook to d1. I think our opponent completely failed to look in that direction because there, black sets up the threat of bishop g3 mate. I think our opponent assumed that if he moves the rook away from the eighth rank, we would have queen a8 check, takes h8, but... Calculating one move further, there's bishop g3 checkmate. So my idea against rook d1 would have just been to play the calm king f1 and try to get the king out of the, the range of the rook. So I think it's winning for white, but we'll check with the engine. Wow. What a what a crazy game. So first order... Yeah, rook d1 is equal. According to the chess.com engine, it is equal. But let's check with the stronger chess base engine because these lines are hard even for the engine. Okay, we'll see. Let's check the accuracy first of all, just out of curiosity, how bad it is. I'm going to copy this game into chess base. And I'm going to pull up the sort of the strong stockfish. Okay, what the accuracy was, it was good. It was 92 to 80, 86. It was a high quality game, but I'm sure there were a lot of mistakes nonetheless. Okay, let me pull up an instance of the game. And let's jump into the analysis. So... All right, I am going to also pull up the chat on my phone because I want to use my other monitor for chess space. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, previously I had recommended two openings against d4, e5. The first is at a lower level, the Vienna Gambit, which is very, very effective, and that's knight f6, f4. 
And the second is uh, the Four Night Scotch, which we've been focusing on in the speed run. Now, before like 1800, we wouldn't even get this position very often. And when we did, people would go either bishop b4 or like knight takes d4, make a bad move. Now, of course, most people know that the main line is bishop b4. And we had this once. I think that game continued like bishop d3, castles, castles. And here our opponent played the inaccurate move d6. After bishop g5, we scored a pretty quick victory. And you can refer to that speedrun game for an exploration of the main line, which is d5. Uh, but in this game, I decided to spice things up with the Belgrade Gambit. So a little history. When was the Belgrade first played? It was first played, according to Chess Base, in the year. What year? Let me see. In the year 1938 by Kurt Richter, who was a master, not like a super famous player. It was played a good amount in the 40s and 50s. Michael Tall played it three times in the 19... No, he played it five times. So Tall was a big early proponent of the bug, and he played it in his youth. Tall played it at, like, age 16 and 17. So I see two games from 1953, 16 years old, and two, three games from 1954. But Tall played it a bunch in his early career. And then, once people discovered, like, some of Black's responses, the Belgrade fell out of fashion, and hopefully, once again, it'll acquire some degree of popularity. So the most popular move uh, in in human games is bishop e7. Bishop e7 is considered by some to refute uh, the Belgrade Gambit completely, but I was able to find, I think, a couple of good ideas that give white some life. So in particular, against bishop e7, there's this computer move, bishop to d3. You just develop your bishop and defend the e-pawn. And this is a much more dangerous idea than it looks because, okay, typically black plays d6. Yeah, so here the move is, is h3. And that much I remember to prevent, to prevent bishop g4. Very important to prevent bishop g4. And if black castles, white also castles. And in my opinion, this position is already quite unpleasant for black. So what makes this position unpleasant for black? Well, first of all, what happens if black takes the knight? Which is probably black's most practical option takes in the 95 but still after knight takes d4 this is my game against eric hansen from the aim chess rapid qualifiers and this position is like a smidge better for white 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 has a little bit more space i was winning at the end of this game but still if black plays carefully it should be it should be equal like white plays c4 and then white plays bishop d2 and rook e1 black should be able to equalize with another few careful moves um but if black doesn't play Knight takes d5. Then things get a little bit more dangerous. So let's play black. Let's say black plays bishop e6. White is already slightly better after knight takes e7 and bishop g5 because this pin is very, very hard to get rid of. Okay, the instinct is to play h6 and g5. But here, after knight takes g5, white is already winning. This is a really cool line that I came across when preparing the Belgrade. And why is this position winning? How do you judge that? Well, the reason is that the knight on f6 is dreadfully weak. And the typical defensive mechanism is to bring the king up to g7. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you should pause and try to figure out how you actually increase the attack on the knight because it's not the obvious move. White to play and win. What's the key idea? Which wins on the spot, by the way? Yeah, it's not queen f3, which I think some newer players might want to play because this doesn't actually attack the knight. Knight has enough defenders. You want to explode the king side with f4 followed by e5 to involve the rook. So, for example, black should probably move the queen away, but now you still play e5, and black just gets massacred on the king side. D, E, F, E. It's very easy to observe that it's checkmate like seven ways to Sunday, such as in this line where, okay, the queen's going to come out to h5 and the game is over. Not even close. So this is one of the instances where this line works like a charm. If black doesn't move their queen, then e5 wins the queen, because in this position... Black has nothing better than just like giving up the queen for a rook and a piece, but obviously white is completely winning here as well. So this is a cool line. Black can circumvent this by playing h6, but that is not a move that everybody's going to be able to uncover. And now you get the bishop pair, you go rook e1, and there's this classic plan where you go b3 and bishop b2 and try to recover the d-pawn. And if you can do that, you'll have a bishop pair and a space advantage. I think this position is easier to play for white, even though it is equal if black is careful. So the first sort of major innovation, and again, I don't know what the guy recommends in the chessable course, but 
my move was always bishop d3 here, and it worked really, really well. A couple of other lines. If black takes on d5 immediately, why is this dangerous for black? Well, already black has to decide where to move this knight. Um, Vidit against me played... No, this is not what Vidit played against me. But black is already worse here. A lot of people go bishop b4 check, bishop d2, and then they deliver another check with the queen. But here, after queen to e2, the end game is better for white. And there's one important line to remember. Let's say what black plays bishop takes d2. We take with the king, obviously, because the queen trade is inevitable. Queen takes e2 check, bishop takes e2, and now knight to e7. You might say, well, we have to take on d4, and then black takes on d5, and black keeps the extra pawn. But here, there's a couple of good options, but I really like the move d6, which is a classic idea. You're losing the pawn anyway, so you're giving it up in order to ruin your opponent's pawn structure permanently. After knight takes d4, white has a very pleasant advantage. This is like plus 0.5. You're going to go bishop f3, you're going to go rook e1, black's bishop is buried. Really, really, really unpleasant position. So actually, knight takes d5 is a mistake, and a lot of GMs play this move. Black is already worse according to the engine. If black plays knight b4, then obviously do not play queen takes d4. Here you go bishop c4 and secure the d5 pawn. And uh, the lines can get kind of crazy here. Like if black gives you this check, you actually just want to slide the king away to f1. And I was looking at lines like these, but this gets very, very advanced, and I'm not going to bore you to death. Uh, with the, like, ultra-advanced details. The last move that I want to cover for now is knight c6 to b4, which is a, a common book recommendation and, and, and is considered to refute the, the Belgrade Gambit by some. Um, this was first played in the year 1947 already. Yuri Averbach was one of the first players to play it against Mikhail Tall. And what's crazy is that Tall actually kind of knew the best line in the 1950s, obviously without accessing the engine. So in my opinion, the best way to give white practical chances here is to play knight takes f6 check, queen takes f6. Now you go a3, attacking uh, the knight. The knight drops back to c6. And now again, you play this like neutral move, bishop to d3. And this was a novelty when I played it against Samuel Sevian also in the aim chess rapid qualifiers. And again, I got a, I, I got a very good position here. Uh, just a moment. Okay, so he, this is actually what I confused with the game continuation. The point is that black doesn't have an easy move. If black plays d6, who can tell me, based on our experience in the game, what white's best move is? And you already know this. If you were paying attention to my in-game commentary, you should know what the best move is. Yeah, now you reposition to b5. And in, in, in theory, or in practice, this is a very hard position for black to play. Black has to know a couple computer moves. Most people who don't know this position go bishop d7, of course. And after castles, white is already slightly better. I've had this line a bunch of times. Here, you bring the other bishop out. And after queen g6, bishop takes e7, black is forced to expose his king and bring it into the center. And here, white gets a very long-lasting initiative with bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6. Now... You have a very powerful move, knight to h4, bringing the knight over to f5 with check. Obviously, e4 is untouchable. And my line ends here. You're going to recover the d-pawn, and you're slightly better. Okay. So that's another dangerous line for black. As I was mentioning during the game, if black brings the bishop out in front of the pawn chain, that walks right into b4. So you can start by castling. Let's say that black also castles. E5 and black and resign. Here, black and literally resign because black gets massacred on the king's side. After knight takes e5, you trade and go rook e1. And the point is that the bishop on c5 is targeted not only with b4, but also with queen to h5. So here, white literally just wins a minor piece. Black has to go to d5. But now in comes another incredible idea c4. And if on facade, then bishop h7 wins the queen. So again, the queen has to move. Let's say that the queen goes back to c6, and now the pawn storm begins. b4, and literally you just trap the bishop. Bishop d6 and c5, the bishop is trapped, as it is after bishop b6 and c5. So this c4 move, really, really easy to miss. Finally, if after rook e1, the queen goes back to d6, then you win just because you have a massive kingside attack, and black is not getting 
the rest of his queenside pieces out. So here, Black has to know to play d6, but all these little details are like wins. And after d6, you play b4. And after bishop b6, you implement one last idea that I'll show you, which is to drop the knight back to d2. Not an intuitive move at all, but the point is simple. You want to go f4 and build up a strong pawn center, then come back to f3 and slowly but surely work on recovering the d4 pawn. You'll go bishop b2, and you can go like Grand Prix style with queen e1, queen g3, and the engine actually likes white here. So also not a refutation by any stretch of the imagination. There are other moves, and I think the most underrated move for black is probably bishop c5. With the idea, I think that if you want to know like a quote-unquote refutation, it's probably this. Because here, bishop g5 is the only logical move, and now bishop comes back to e7. This is like a very engine-y line. And unfortunately, I analyzed this. I looked at this position. Here, white is worse. And I came to the conclusion that white has nothing better than to give away the bishop, go bishop to b5, and basically go for complete liquidation and likely a draw, like castles. Takes, 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 takes. Black is not really better here, but it is a very hard position for white to win. So if black wants to make a draw, bishop c5 is the way to do it, but that's a very rare move. Most people don't come up with this move intuitively because of bishop g5. Okay, enough with the overview. Let's go to the game. h6, which is a move that I wasn't too familiar with. It's rare, and already my response was a mistake. Yeah, bishop d3 is already a mistake, according to the engine. Of course, I confused the line. I confused this with, um, like, knight b4. Here, the best move is a relatively simple one. You're supposed to go bishop c1 to f4, attacking the c7 pawn. Okay, so black probably goes d6, and now we just recover the pawn on d4 with a slight edge. Much less complicated than I made it out to be. One other important idea to be aware of, this trap also exists in the London system. I know Eric Rosen has won a ton of games like this. In the London system, if only I could remember where this trick is applied. I'm trying to remember. It's, it's, it's a thing in the London. Maybe somebody can even remind me. But back to like the, the current position. What is White's winning move here? What is White's winning move here? Very, very important to know. Now, it's not Queen E2 because Black can actually take and drop the Knight back to E6. Doesn't work. It, this move comes out of nowhere and it wins on the spot. Punch your opponent in the face, not quite. All right, somebody has to see it. Come on, guys. I know it's late. Knight b5, yeah. And the pawn on c7 cannot be defended. God, I really want to remember what the London system trick is because it's so similar. And a lot of strong players have fell for it. Let me Google it. London system knight b5 trick. Five traps in the London system. I mean, I'd have to go through all the Eric Rosen videos, but I'll have to leave that for another day. But after knight b5, black can resign because c7 is lost. What does that mean? That means that the pawn on e4 is untouchable. And if black tries to liquidate, black is going to get into a, a massively cramped position where the bishop cannot be developed because you take g7. And if the bishop cannot be developed, then black has a very, very hard time just moving anything. Uh, so that's yet another unpleasant line for black. So the correct move here was just bishop to f4. Um, if in this position black does like takes, takes, and bishop b4, check this, essentially transposes into the line we already looked at. h6 doesn't really change anything. We don't need the g5 square anyway. So we looked at this through the move order, like takes, takes, bishop b4, bishop d2. The addition of h6 does not really favor black in the slightest. So good to know. h6, bishop b4 is correct. Okay, so we played bishop d3, which is... Decent, but definitely not uh, the topical move. And d6 by our opponent was also a mistake. After d6, the position is about equal due to bishop b5. The correct move was bishop c5. And in fact, h6 makes a lot of sense in this context because now we can't go bishop g5. Well, how big of a deal is that? Well, it's a pretty big deal because if we just sleepwalk our way through the rest of the opening, black is going to get sort of an ideal setup where g5 is covered, d4 is defended, and we can't engineer our like classic counterplay with b4. So it's like minus over plus here. We're in trouble. Because white is no white is out of ideas. Like the engine move is a3, trying to prepare b4, but black can obviously go a5 and prevent it. And white just has to like play down a pawn, right? And go like bishop d2, black castles, 
And the engine finds some way to generate counterplay with B4, but this is very, very iffy. So a good example of, of like trying to use common sense rather than remembering the lines, which is something I always preach and, and then don't practice. Like you're, you're facing an unfamiliar move. Don't try to remember your analysis. Try to use common sense. And bishop d3 just doesn't pass the smelt this. So d6 allows bishop b5. And now things get really interesting. So a6, bishop a4, b5, bishop b3 makes a lot of sense. Now I think our opponent made another inaccuracy. I mean, knight e5 leads to very interesting complications. According to the computer, the correct move would have just been a simple developing move, bishop e7. And the position almost resembles a Rue Lopez. In fact, Probably this could have even transposed from Marie Lopez. White castles, black castles, and a4 is now the best move. Typical Rui Lopez idea. And the position is about equal. Very, very double-edged. White has enough compensation for the pawn, but probably not more than that. Like bishop g4 leads to crazy complications. White recovers the pawn on c7. Okay, and, and things continue. Position is about equal. Queen b7, knight d5. Knight e5, just a very, very complicated middle game with chances for both sides. But our opponent tried to force things off the board with knight e5. Now we had to see knight takes d4. This is a critical idea. Of course, the original Noah's Ark trap, which I mentioned, happens in the Ruy Lopez. And the original Noah's Ark trap involves white playing d4 overzealously. Black plays b5, then black plays knight takes d4. And in this position, white has to gambit away the pawn. Because if you take on d4, black wins a minor piece with c5. White plays queen d5. Black plays bishop b6. You might think that you have a repetition of moves. But the bishop has gone from c8 to d7, which means the rook is now defended. Which means the black can now play c4. Tons of games in the database. I have to refresh to get the uh, game open again. So that's the sort of skeleton, skeletal idea of pushing the pawn forward two squares. And I would generalize this to a type of idea that is missed very, very frequently in a lot of openings where the, the basic point is that you push the pawn forward, attacking one piece, that piece has to move, and then you push the pawn forward one more square, attacking a piece that then is, is trapped. And this can be a very hard pattern to spot. Two famous examples that I've shown before on stream. And the Alakine... This trick exists, and Gary Gasparov lost a very famous game in which he could have won a minor piece with that trick. So here we go. Okay, let me see if I can get chess space to work. Okay, so here is Gary's game against Alex Yermolinsky from a uh, under-18 Soviet championship. Final round, this was a super important game, and... Crazy things happen in this position where Alex goes Alex goes knight a to e7. And Gary like quickly plays knight b3 and continues playing, and he ended up losing the game. What did he miss? Well, obviously I'm talking about it, so now you should see this very quickly. The winning idea is to go g4. You attack one minor piece, force the bishop back, and g5 traps the bishop on f6. That's why knight e7 was wrong, because it cuts off the bishop's escape route. Okay, the second example uh, that, that is in a similar kind of category is Tivyakov against Kamsky. And this feature is like a really, really beautiful move that sets this idea up. So this is a young Gara who fell victim to this idea. Let's see who remembers this example, because I've definitely shown it before in the speedrun. Kamsky, Tivyakov. So Gara was not a GM yet, neither was Tivyakov. And in this accelerated dragon, Gata plays a pretty natural move. He centralizes his knight and offers some trades. So black to play and win the game by force. Let's see who can spot or who can remember the, the beautiful winning idea. And this starts with a very paradoxical move that is another one of those mental blocks that prevent you from looking at certain types of moves. Now, what could that first move be? It's not, no, queen b6 blunders the queen. What seems to be the least natural way to trade pieces here for black? So what are we taught in the Sicilian and the dragon not to do? Yeah, we're taught not to give away the dark squared bishop. But if you look at this carefully, you start seeing that there's a cluster fill in the blank in the center. So you might say, oh, let's go e5. But here the bishop is not trapped and has e3. But what if we could take away the e3 square? By doing what? By playing e6 first 
Knight f4, e5 is a fork, so the knight has to go back to e3. And now e5 traps the bishop. It has a7, but after rook b7, it's out of squares. And Kamsky was forced to give the bishop up, and he ends up losing the game. So this is like a lot of ideas rolled up in one. But another thing to file away into your mental directory of tactical ideas, where you push the pawn, tack one minor piece, and then advance it forward, trapping another. The most famous instance of this is the Noah's Ark, which is why I had to look for a concrete way to get this bishop out. And we found one, which is takes and, and bishop d5. And I think the evaluation of this position hinges largely on whether black can play cd. And according to the engine, this position is equal. Oh, this is going to get really juicy. So f3 allows knight takes f3. And apparently it's still equal, but black obviously has a huge initiative. So this is out of the question. But what does black do after queen to d2? Oh, here we go again. Black has an incredible move. It's the only move that doesn't lose. Let's see who can find it. It's not totally like out of the ordinary because you should notice that the queen and the Malcolm Tucker on a roll, it's bishop f3. The king, queen and the king are on forkable squares. So you might say, ah, well, let's play bishop to h3. But here, white can advance the f pawn and connect the queen of the g pawn. So it's important to put it on f3 to also immobilize the f pawn. And things get wild here. So white can actually castle in black's face, but then white gets checkmated. This is like a lobster pincer mate. This is unstoppable. So white has to defend the g2 pawn. The only way to do that is to play rook g1. But now more tactics. Bishop takes g2. You can't take because of the fork. So white can try a really devilish move, bishop c6 check, in order to deflect the knight from e5. And if the knight takes, then the rook takes, and white is up in exchange. But black doesn't have to take the bishop. But king d8 would be a horrible blunder. It would allow a sudden mating attack. So black has to find king e7 here. Yes, Jen. White still plays queen a5, setting up threats of queen c7. And you just get wild tactical complications. Just look at the engine line, and you will freaking fall off your chair. Queen f3. All of these are only moves. Bishop d5. G5. A4. D3, and of course this ends in a draw. CD, knight D3, king D2. Now for some reason black doesn't take on F2 with check, that loses. Oh, of course. This position, white is this, winning the queen, naturally. Very obvious line. So black has to go back to E5, and you get a repetition of moves. King goes back to E1, and this is the way that the game would have ended. Totally natural, simple line. Alternatively, alternatively, White can play the immediate queen a5. White doesn't have to play bishop c6 check. And here we get a simpler repetition. Knight f3 check. King can't go to e2 because of the rook hanging with check. And now black has to go back to e5, and white has nothing better than to repeat moves. Here, if black takes the rook, he gets mated with bishop c6 and queen c7. So, amazing. Black had to find cd, bishop g4, and bishop f3. And this is findable. I would say that it is findable if you see bishop f3. This is the key move that I think our opponent missed. If he had seen it, I think he would have realized that, well, black gets massive practical play for the exchange. And I can sense that there was something, I just couldn't put my finger on it. I think most people would play this move. But this is just an empty one-move threat that allows white to play queen f4. So, yeah, so that's, that's that. And instead, our opponent played the immediate bishop g4, allowing us to conserve our knight with knight to e2. And now clearly white is better. Rook b8. And we castle. Black plays bishop e7. And this is... Okay, not this, but the next position is another critical moment. We go f3. Our opponent goes bishop e6. And now we have to decide whether to proceed positionally or tactically, which is always a very hard decision. I'm pretty confident that f4 is, at the very least, a practically promising move. To reiterate... What I was saying during the game, the problem with knight f4 is that you reach kind of an impasse because the moment you take the bishop, you correct black's pawn structure. And you can't drop back to b3 because you get your bishop trapped. So I didn't see a future for this knight once it reached f4. If you had wanted to play this more positionally, the computer recommends kind of an interesting idea, which is in fact to take on e6 and then play f4. So this is almost a cross between playing it positionally. No, it is positional. It is very positional. So now, rather than playing e5, which is what we kind of did in the game, 
White can try to carve out the d5 square yet again with what move? This is a very positional idea. Yeah, white plays f5, classic concept. Obviously, if black plays e5, then you're completely winning strategically. You get the knight to d5. And if black does, does not react, if black castles, thank you, 98 for the raid, you go knight f4. And again, you forcibly are getting your knight to d5. If black takes, you have queen d5 winning the knight on c6. So already after knight f4, black is in a bit of trouble. So this would have been, this is super, super advanced. You like correct black's pawn structure and then undo it by pushing your pawn forward. Super interesting. I considered the move a4, but black just goes b4. I wasn't really sure what we gained from that. So yeah, a4 is, is a move to be aware of in all of these positions. But in this case, I don't really see what it gives white. Okay, so instead we went super, super tactical. We went f4 and e5. Black has to take and black has to take again. Now, bishop takes c6. Again, according to the strong stockfish, there was a stronger move, and the stronger move was to start with knight f4. This is almost unfindable. Like, bishop takes c6 is so natural to get the queen onto a square where you can attack it with tempo, but apparently this was even stronger. But we're going to ignore that moment for now. Bishop e6, queen e6 is totally natural. Knight f4. And our opponent was finding only moves. Queen c6 only move to keep the balance. Now knight d5 is also best. So a quick explanation of why the other moves fail. Queen d6, knight d5 just looks terrible for black because bishop f4 is coming. And if black tries to trade the pieces with knight f6, we still go bishop f4 and we just win the exchange and get a technically winning endgame. The other squares are even less appetizing. Queen b6, knight d5, and if the queen moves to the f-file, you're walking into a discovery. So by process of elimination, this is the only logical move. Now... A moment where I think 95% of players would go rookie one. This is such a natural move, but it's minus over plus. White is almost losing after rookie one. And it's because black plays knight f6. And the point of this move is twofold. The first is that you restrict the knight on f4 completely. But the second, the more important one, is that if white plays, for instance, queen e2, oh, you can even castle immediately. Incredible tactics. Queen takes e7. And rook a e8 wins the rook on e1 because white is not coordinated. But you could also go rook b7 and then castle. And we already know that once black castles, there is no longer any compensation. So therefore, we had to take more immediate measures to prevent castling. That's where knight d5 comes from. Okay, bishop f6 is a really impressive move. Um, I was expecting, of course, knight f6. And here, I was going to take the bishop. Black takes back, and we play bishop f4. And oftentimes, the evaluation in such positions are equal. What do I mean when I say in such positions? So it's positions where the king is going to be weak for the foreseeable future. So often, white has enough compensation, but not more than that. Like, black's pawn balances out the lack of king safety. But black also has to be very, very careful. Like, rook b to d8 loses on the spot to the move rook e1 check. And the king can't move back because of queen takes rook mate. So there's a lot of mine, mines that black has to avoid stepping on. So correct is rook b c8. And okay, like the game continues. We play bishop b5. I would take white here any day. But it's all zeros according to the engine after rook hd8. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Yeah, a lot of very technical lines here. But still, this is how you learn how to play dynamic positions. Instead, our opponent put the bishop on f6. And, of course, we bring our queen into the game with queen f3. Oh, and this loses. This is a losing move. Wow, black had a winning line here. Winning, like, plus two. And I am using the computer a lot here, but that's only because, like, I have to. Otherwise, we won't get to the truth of this position. The correct move here was bishop f4, which I rejected because... Why did I reject bishop f4? I don't even know. Black has to move the rook to c8, and we play queen e1 and rook to d1. Uh, with long-term attacking chances. White is white is doing great here. What did I miss after queen f3? So the correct move was bishop d4 check, which of course I saw. But in this position, I thought that black is losing because he can't castle due to knight e7. And I missed a pretty simple move. Missed a pretty simple move. What is the move that I missed? Knight d7 to e5, which hits the queen and also protects black's queen against various discoveries. So you might say, well, why is this such a big deal? White can just, yeah, like queen e4. But now the white knight is victimized. Black plays rook d8. 
And white is busted. Like the knight hangs, there's no more ideas. You have to go back to c3, allowing black to castle with just a technically winning position. So after knight e5, white has to take extraordinary measures. And instead, the more resilient move is queen g3. With the idea of meeting queen takes d5, not with queen takes g7. This is an empty move. Black just defends easily. But rather with c3. And this still remains very, very tricky because... After black castles, white plays c takes d4, black plays c takes d4. You can play bishop takes h6 here. And here black has an only move. Without this move, black is losing here. What does black do to defend g7 without giving up an exchange? Important concept to be aware of. Knight e5, back to g6, very good. White is out of attacking ideas, and black consolidates his extra pawn. So, completely missed knight e5. And this just shows you why leading with the queen is often a bad idea, because the queen is both a super powerful attacker, but also a massive liability, and it's a double-edged sword kind of thing. So queen f3 was a mistake, but in response, rook c8 was also a mistake, and now the position remains equal. Check. King f8, bishop f4, so now we bring our bishop into the attack. Bishop takes b2 is best, according to the engine. Rook ad1. And our opponent defended perfectly here. Knight f6 is again best. And c3 is the best move. So this time I did, you know, I did come through. And just a quick window into what I was trying to figure out here. My inclination was to take on f6. But the problem here is that black just takes back with the bishop. Of course, the point is queen takes f3 gets checkmated. This is a beautiful mating pattern. And if black plays queen takes f6... Well, then you have like a move like rook d6 right, with an attack. But black takes back with the bishop, and you don't have this deflection because the bishop controls d8. And white just has no ideas here. You have a check on d6. This looks very tempting, but it's a dead end because the king travels to h7, and white is out of ideas again. So all of these forcing moves just don't lead anywhere. And that's where I came up with the idea of essentially keeping the tension. Now, what... Can white do to keep the tension? Well, the, an easy way to improve our chances is to cut off the bishop to play c3. Um, and amazingly, our opponent finds the only moves to draw. Bishop takes c3 is correct. And this is a great instance of our opponent blundering and getting in, in his own head because he chatted me that he blundered rook d8 and just kind of gave up hope, assumed, assumed that the position was lost, but in fact, it's equal. Amazing. So bishop takes c3 is the only move. If instead black tries to run with king g8, here the best move is bishop e5 and white keeps a massive attack. Notice that you don't go rook d8 because of king h7 and black survives. So bishop c3 is correct. Check takes, takes, takes. Now bishop c7 is also correct. And this forces black into finding an only move. And that only move, the saving resource was rook to d1. And again, the point is that in this position, white cannot capture the rook on h8 because of checkmate. Now, my plan against rook d1 was to evacuate with the king to play king f1. This actually loses to bishop h4 check. The correct move here after rook d1 would have been to force a draw. White has nothing better than to force perpetual, which you can do in a variety of ways, but an easy way to force perpetual is like this. The reason that king f1 is bad is because black plays bishop h4, then puts the rook on e1, then runs the king over to g8, and remember that black is up material here. Black has two rooks and two pawns for the queen. But who can tell me what the saving idea is after g3? This seems to cut off and attack both the rook and the, and the bishop at the same time. And all of this hinges on one critical move, rook e6. But I can give you a check. But the king runs up and, and discovers an attack on the queen, so you still can't take the bishop. And finally, black consolidates. So king f1 is just too slow. It's a draw. Also possible is to give a check and come back to f3. Remember, earlier piece of advice, when you're trying to disarm a discovery, attack the tail of the discovery. Don't try to attack the bishop. Try to attack the piece that's actually giving the check. That way you can avoid you know, the brunt of the discovery. And here, actually, black needs to be very accurate. Or no, rook a1, queen e4 check. Now black plays king d7, you play queen d5 check. And black can take on c7, and then white picks up the rook in the corner. It's still a draw. 
But Black can even hide behind the bishop with a crazy, crazy uh, perpetual check. Check here, check here. So Black doesn't touch the bishop. Because the moment Black touches the bishop, you win the rook in the corner. This is still a draw. But here Black has to work for it. Just an insane, insane complications. Um, but all of this was correct, and it's Turkey 8, of course, that loses the game. It loses all of the pieces. You just lose the rook and also the bishop. So I had a game like this even in this very speedrun where I blundered my queen, and then it like turned out to be the correct move. So you should never give up hope like this. right? Even after a blunder, you should just consider the situation as it is and try to find the best resource. Rook 8 was an emotional reaction by our opponent. And obviously didn't didn't blunder check didn't didn't see bishop d6. Wow, what an absolutely wild game and an introduction to the Belgrade Gambit. So, what are the important points of this game? And you're lost, I'm lost. That kind of was the point of my explanation, and I'll bring this all together nicely in the end. But a couple of key points after knight d5, we explored some of Black's options. Oh, last thing I wanted to point out: if Black takes on e4, which of course is super common at, at the lower levels. Again, you play in like the modern Belgrade style where you just develop your pieces. You go bishop d3, you castle, and you can explore this on your own, but basically white gets massive compensation for the two pawns. This is virtually unplayable for black. So we looked at knight d5, we looked at knight b4, we looked at bishop b7, and of course our opponent played a rare move to which I should have responded bishop f4. Instead, I went bishop d3 allowing bishop c5. But now the position almost transposes into our Rui Lopez. We talked about the Noah's Ark trap and ways to avoid it, uh, which I did by attacking the rook in the corner, only move. Then Black had this crazy CD bishop g4 resource, sacking the exchange, which he missed, giving me a clear advantage. Now the engine finds this bishop e6, f4, f5 idea to carve out the d5 square would have been the easiest way to solidify an advantage. And now the craziness begins once the center opens up. Knight f4, queen d6. By and large, it was pretty accurately played by both of us, with the major exception of queen f3. This was a big blunder, allowing bishop d4 and knight e5. And, of course, the second major blunder was all the way in the end. All of this was correct. And really, it's sad, but rook e8 was, was the losing move. Rook d1 would have kept an equal position. Probably your reaction to all this as well. Those lines were interesting. Like, I was entertained, hopefully. But what, you know, what do I learn from this? Like, what, what is the key takeaway from the speedrun? And honestly, the biggest takeaway is that there is none. And what you should take solace in is the fact that, as you can see, I'm, probably, I'm just as confused as you are in these wild positions. So when you get to a certain level, when the position is this chaotic, it's not like title players have a certain way of approaching it that prevents you from making blunders. And so if you're trying to beat higher rateds, that's why the common advice is always to go into sharp positions. Because in sharp positions, there's just a much higher probability that a detail will be missed. Um, but at some point, you just have to rely on your intuition. And my intuition was largely correct that white is okay here. But as you can see, I missed like a gazillion of these details. And uh, there, there is nothing to understand in these types of positions. You have to understand certain guidelines, such as the fact that, okay, you sacrificed a pawn. You should not be afraid to go for what I call a long-term attack. Like here, for instance, you should not be afraid to just trade and play bishop f4. You shouldn't catastrophize when you've only sacrificed a pawn. And sometimes you just need to go for long-term pressure against the king when nothing immediate manifests itself. But the other thing is that these wide open positions have no guiding principles. You just need to calculate. You need to pick up on tactical patterns such as like the undefended queen or forks or pins. Like you have to do all of that gr grunt work. But by and large, you're, you're on your own. It's the Wild West in these positions. And that's why calculation is ultimately the most important skill in chess because it allows you to play these posi positions without making a blunder on every move. And that's that. Crazy game. We've had a couple of them. Good game to my opponent. Thanks again. Any final questions? This was a bit all over the place for, for a speedrun presentation, but I don't think there's any other way of like analyzing this game other than just being all over the place and looking at a bunch of cool lines and you know ending at that. Yeah, super, super cool. Cool stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll end it here. want to remind everybody on YouTube that if you want to support me, you like my content, subscribing really, really helps. You know, it's I'm uh, fighting the algorithm. So every person who tells their friends about the channel, obviously, if if you enjoy the content, 
is a massive help to me. My ultimate goal is to reach 500k subs in six months. Super ambitious, but I think we can do it. Thanks, everybody. And I'll see you guys later. Thanks for hanging out. Goodbye.